Hello and welcome to Maximum Tupac, the first talking book about Tupac Shakur. It was written and researched by Darren Brooks. Music is by Amanda Thompson and it's read by Sean Jones. You can check out our full catalogue on our website at www.chromedreams.co.uk. I was necessarily the best rapper, the best nothing. I think I'm the, the realest nigga out there. I do think that. I think I own that. If I could pack being real, I think I own that. Because I think being real is just being true. It was only supposed to be a night out at the boxing. On the 7th of September 1996, Mike Tyson was continuing his relentless rise back to the top of boxing's heavyweight charts with a high-profile bout versus Bruce Sheldon in Las Vegas. As had become commonplace at such glamorous events, the celebrity contingent was conspicuous by its presence in the opulent surroundings of the MGM Grand Hotel. Two such celebrities were Marion Suge Knight, charismatic boss of Death Row Records, and Tupac Shakur, the multi-talented rapper and actor who had become the centerpiece of Knight's influential hip-hop label. For centerpiece, though, also read Mouthpiece. Previous years had witnessed an increasingly volatile war between the rapping fraternities of opposing American coasts, a conflict which had already delivered its share of shootings and urban as well as media battles. Roles of the involved personnel had long since been defined. Knight and Shakur represented the West, whilst the likes of Sean Puffy Coombs, more popularly known as Puff Daddy and Biggie Smalls, were public ambassadors for the East. A previously verbal war had gradually degenerated into the physical as conflicts were now being fought openly on the streets of America, as well as through the tried and tested media of newspapers, magazines and music. This particular September evening, though, witnessed tragic events that would ultimately send shockwaves throughout the music world and incite further violence as a hugely successful musician and symbol of the West Coast Brotherhood left the mortal world at the behest of a rogue gunman. Untimely death has long been acknowledged as a shot in the arm for the career of a musician. In addition, the presence of a somewhat nefarious reputation can also assist in providing an artist with a certain X factor, that indefinable ingredient which can promote a singer from also ran to seductive star. Tupac Shakur possessed the latter in abundance and would ultimately join the former, that elite band of brothers whose lives had been criminally and cruelly cut short. He was only 25 years of age when he met his death in Las Vegas, his untapped talent yet to be fully explored, but such was his prolific nature he had already compiled a body of work so comprehensive that his career would shine brightly for years after his departure. Posthumous singles, albums and movies seemed never-ending in the months after his death. Such releases allowed established fans to mourn their hero through his work, whilst those previously unaware of Tupac Shakur were given wider opportunity to hear the music of an artist whose destiny had proved to be that of unwilling martyr for the lifestyle of gangster rap. His gift for music and performance was undeniable, but it was the endless controversy persistently snapping at his heels, which, while providing his public persona with a certain glamour, would eventually lead to his downfall. The gang war, having threatened to explode for some years, had been raised to such a level that it seemed only a matter of time until another life was taken. When the hostilities finally erupted, it was the life of one of the genre's most successful artists that was claimed. Tupac's life had seen its fair share of deprivation, of a regular father, a regular home, but never of love and, without doubt, never of talent. His mother named him after an Inca Indian chief, Tupac Amaru, meaning shining serpent, and Shakur, an Arabic word which, when translated into English, reads as thankful to God. With the support of such spiritual influence, Tupac wasted little time in shining his own unique light onto the world and into the lives of those fortunate enough to be part of his life. It seemed as though he was fully aware that his life was to be short, such was his capacity to fill his existence to the very brim. 
A candle was lit the very day he was born, and the shining serpent had a life to lead before it burned irrevocably away. Take a deep breath, world. Here comes Tupac Amaru Shakur. young black males are not violent, they're all not taking the law into their own hands, they're all not going to that extreme to accomplish some sort of um, achievement in their life. So this is just another way of showing how you can be a young black male and accomplish something. Tupac Shakur was born Lassane Parrish Crooks in Brooklyn, New York on the 16th of June 1971. The first born of Alice Faye Walker and William Garland, both passionate supporters of radical politics, his mother would change his conventional name to the more ethereal Tupac Amaru Shakur, whilst the future star-to-be was still a young child. She insisted on such a name for her child, wanting him to be aware he was a product of the world, of a wider culture, and not merely a commodity from a brutal Bronx neighborhood. Just as the fortunes that the future held in store for him, Tupac was born amidst family controversy. His mother, more commonly known as Afini Shakur, possessed a revolutionary nature and was a promoter of Afro-American rights. She eventually became a card-carrying member of the New York branch of the Black Panther Party, having become hooked on radical politics following her attendance at a Black Power conference in Philadelphia. In 1969, she was arrested on suspicion of conspiracy to bomb several public areas of New York City. She was released on bail and soon afterwards learned she was carrying her first child. In February of 1971, now heavily pregnant with Tupac, her bail was revoked and she was sentenced to spend time in the Women's House of Detention in Greenwich Village. In May, she was finally freed, having been acquitted on all charges against her. And just a month later, she brought Tupac into the world. Tupac was subjected to a nomadic childhood, the family spending much of his early years travelling back and forth between the Bronx and Harlem, often being reduced to living in shelters along the way. Such a lifestyle, however, would ensure the young Tupac felt somewhat detached from his contemporaries and the world, a consequence of the lack of opportunity available to him to put down roots. There was the nagging feeling he came from somewhere yet nowhere, compounded, of course, by the lack of a regular father figure. He had been told at a young age that his natural father was dead, but he was to discover otherwise in later years. This absence of a stable family life would merely compound his feeling of social and domestic detachment. As a consequence of his mother's choice of lifestyle, Tupac found himself in an ever-changing family unit, with a series of his mother's male companions and several other additions to the family, brought about by these liaisons, including two half-siblings, a brother and a sister, as well as his first accepted stepfather, Mutula Shakur. However, he would soon lose Matula to prison following his involvement in a fatal armed robbery. Indeed, a second recognised stepfather, Geronimo Pratt, followed the same unfortunate path. Eventually, a character from the Bronx known as Legs joined the family in Harlem after he and Afini became lovers. A young Tupac, desperately craving the security of a secure home, laid claim to Legs as the latest paternal presence in his life. It was when he reached the age of 12 that an early talent for show business manifested. Encouraged by his mother to enrol in a Harlem theatre group, namely the 127th Street Ensemble, Tupac dazzled audiences in his early stage performances, easily adapting to the art of theatre and music. Even at this embryonic stage, a career in the arts for Tupac Shakur seemed assured. The family moved yet again, however, in 1986 to Baltimore, where Tupac sought to further his studies in performing arts by enlisting at the prestigious Baltimore School of Arts. Having been accepted to study ballet and acting, it became increasingly apparent that music was to play a prominent role in his life, and fate conspired to ensure music and history collided in Baltimore, as Tupac, under the adopted name of MC New York, wrote and performed his first rap. 
With that initial composition under his belt, his time at Baltimore proved extremely worthwhile and provided the adolescent Tupac with an established career goal. Indeed, his personality and raw talent left a lasting impression on those who taught him. In turn, it was they who were helping to shape his skills and assist in facilitating his obvious potential. It was his family's departure from Baltimore, though, that witnessed the turning of the tide. After just two short, relatively settled years for Tupac, his mother decided to uproot once more and thus subject her children's lives to further upheaval. Their destination on this occasion was California and the family set up home in Marin City. Whilst already accustomed to such a desultory manner of living, this particular relocation had a much more profound effect upon an impressionable Tupac, to the extent that the early promise he had developed as a performer now came under genuine threat. True talent, however, is impossible to hide, and although life in Marin City saw him fall seriously by the wayside, it became an experience that would colour his attitude as an artist. For Tupac Shakur, real life was only just beginning. had no money and no record deal. Why are you gonna try to destroy another nigga career? Don't do that. Represent by example. I'm not saying my lifestyle is the best. I'm saying this is the lifestyle most lived by the most motherfuckers out there. Whilst the Shakurs landed in the city of Marin, Tupac would soon find himself immersed in hot water. The travelling lifestyle to which he had been continually exposed was now beginning to have an adverse effect on the prodigious youngster, and within months of settling in the city, he made the decision to leave the family home and fell into the unforgiving arms of homelessness. A downward spiral was at this point set in motion, eventually culminating in him taking up residence with a nearby drug dealer. Tupac himself became reliant upon drug dealing to supply an income. Subsequent interviews with Tupac about this period in his life see him freely admitting that his departure from Baltimore and more specifically leaving behind his vocational education at the School of Arts was the crucial component in his diversion from the straight and narrow. He was forced to absorb another body blow when he discovered his stepfather, Matulu Shakur, had been convicted for his part in a 1981 armed robbery and, as a result, jailed for a total of 60 years. Tupac, however, showing the kind of resilience that would characterise his developing career as a rapper, rose above such misfortune. His rapping skills were continuing to flourish and he had begun to compile a catalogue of rap lyrics. Indeed, he even managed to secure the services of his first manager, one Leila Steinberg. It was at this time he assembled his first band, entitled Strictly Dope, with several of his peers, and the band went on to record an unreleased album with TNT Records. It was Tupac as an individual, though, whose talent was transporting him to high places. His abilities as a dancer, cultivated in Baltimore, were also about to be recognised thanks to Steinberg and her introduction of him to Shock G, member of the band Digital Underground. Based in Berkeley, this rap collective ultimately achieved Grammy nominations, but they were unaware that in the process they were also contributing yet further to the history of rap music by giving a young Tupac Shakur his first big break. In 1989, at the tender age of 18, he was invited by Shock G to join the band on tour, ostensibly as a roadie and dancer. But, as it transpired, there would be so much more to be gained from his association with the band. His vast gifts as a rapper were duly noted and Shock G, suitably impressed, granted him the opportunity to appear alongside the band on their next recording. Tupac was about to make the leap from raw talented rookie to that of professional rapper, and it was a move he would make with awesome ease. If anything was to hold him back, it would be his tough guy reputation, which was proliferating at a relentless rate, and he was rapidly becoming a focus of the law wherever he travelled. 
In fact, he had been arrested on no less than eight occasions before he left his teenage years behind. His artistic reputation then was growing in almost identical proportion to that of his felonious record. Surely, though, the latter couldn't affect the former, or could it? saying be honest you doing something i can't do and i'm doing something you can't do i respect you respect me you know there's no nigga out here like this i don't have no insecurity about that and no no delusions i'm the future of black america digital underground having employed the burgeoning tupac as a dancer now had another rapper on board who was clearly focused upon making the leap to fully fledged recording artist he began by adding his rap skills to the track Same Song, which appeared on the plainly entitled This Is An EP release, as well as featuring on the long player Sons of the P. His talent, finally committed to disc and with a guaranteed audience, would see him made an irresistible offer. Just months after his recording debut with Digital Underground, the Interscope record label dropped into his lap a recording contract all of his own. He grabbed the chance with both hands and situated himself at once in the nearest recording studios to begin work on his debut release. When the final product emerged in November 1991, it caught the US music press unawares, being as it was a much looser sounding work than the product of Digital Underground, as well as containing that vital ingredient, a huge portion of attitude. The 13-track album, released under the title Two Pacalypse Now, contained many a rapper's delight. It provided his breakthrough hit Brenda's Got a Baby, an aching track in which the story of a teenage pregnancy is movingly told, and which betrayed a great deal of sensitivity in a music genre more popularly noted for its bombast. As well as spawning a further hit single in Trapped, the album sold comfortably enough to bring a smile to the lips of his new paymasters. Smiles were not the order of the day elsewhere, however, as Tupac and specifically his debut record was soon called into question in the courtrooms of America and, incredibly, in Congress. The album embraced the myriad strands of the gangster rap machismo and, with its references to such unsavoury subjects as cop killing, had already found itself exposed to intense debate in the gossip columns and letters pages of the US media. However, it was Vice President Dan Quayle, already at loggerheads with the entertainment industry in his continuing battle to promote traditional family values, who would describe the record as having no place in our society. From that point onwards, Interscope knew that they held in their hands something very special. Tupac's debut album mutated into a fearless fly in the face of authority, and that alone was newsworthy in the eyes of young music buyers, and, thanks to such unexpected publicity, the album continued to do brisk business. As if such high-reaching controversy was not enough, there was more to come as the record found itself at the heart of a murder trial. An American lawyer defending a 19-year-old man accused of killing a Texas trooper claimed that Tupacalypse Now, an album the defendant owned, incited him to kill. Tupac, though, failed to crumble under the weight of such intense scrutiny, perhaps partly because there was continuing legal activity in his own private life. Back in California, he was arrested for jaywalking and subsequently filed a $10 million lawsuit against Oakland police for alleged police brutality. Although the case was taken a little further, the incident served to underline that Tupac was not only gaining notoriety as a result of his newly established commercial viability, but he was also developing an unwelcome reputation for aggressive non-conformity. Crucially at this point, America's rap scene was being divided into opposing factions, East Coast versus West Coast, and such attitude was a prerequisite for membership of either gang. Tupac incidentally falling on the west side of the fence. His career, however, remained defiantly unaffected by the activities that swirled incessantly around him. 
Indeed, his star quality would combine with his teenage training to supply him with a further career option. He was about to be offered the chance to make the crossover from recording artist to movie star. The music industry might continue to provide his regular main meal, but the silver screen was to prove a very tasty dessert. His debut album was consolidating in the face of voluble congressional concern. His celebrity status had increased tenfold, and he was about to see his name on cinema screens throughout the land. Without any shadow of a doubt, Tupac Shakur had arrived. I'm out here in the streets, you know what I mean? Whooping niggas ass, starting wars and shit, putting it down, dropping albums. Shit. As the gang warfare of the rap scene continued to fragment into antagonistic indiscipline, movies would prove to be a welcome diversion for Tupac Shakur. Having already appeared briefly in the movie Nothing But Trouble, starring Chevy Chase and Danny DeVito, it was to be 1992, less than a year after the release of his debut album, that would see him make his first headlining role on the big screen. The script he was offered was that of the domestic drama Juice, directed by Ernest R. Dickerson. Tupac's high profile secured him the lead role of Bishop in a tale of four young African-American teenagers whose lives changed dramatically after their decision to commit a robbery. Although the movie was only a modest success in cinemas, Tupac was praised for a performance that would lead to a proliferation of offers for further movie work. Although he was forced to turn down some roles due to music commitments, he accepted the opportunity to star alongside Janet Jackson in his next project. He took the male lead in Poetic Justice, a modern-day road movie directed by John Singleton. The story focuses upon a young woman, who reluctantly agrees to go on the road with her best friend and her mailman, Lucky, played by Tupac, following the murder of her boyfriend. Filming of the movie provided a series of tense moments, one of which being Jackson's insistence that Tupac undergo an HIV test before she would film any love scenes between them. Such tensions were apparent in the final product, and their on-screen chemistry, whilst not overtly affecting the movie as a whole, was somewhat distant. His relationship with the film's director also suffered, as his continuing inability to steer clear of trouble forced John Singleton to drop him from his next film, Higher Learning, later that year. With a twist of irony, Singleton eventually cast Ice Cube, a rapper who had been a great influence on Tupac's music career. The unabated aggression in Tupac's life emanated almost entirely from the East Coast-West Coast gang wars, which continued to escalate at a relentless pace. But his own pugnacious nature would see him too often in the company of police officers. Just months after Juice opened in cinemas, Tupac was involved in a fight with a number of former associates from his days in Marin City. This was no ordinary brawl, though, and resulted in tragedy, as a six-year-old bystander was shot in the head. Tupac's half-brother, Morris Harding, also a member of the band Thug Life, was arrested in connection with the incident, but was ultimately released due to lack of evidence. There were a string of such unpleasant incidents just prior to the release of his second film that further reinforced the gangster image that Tupac had embraced. In March 1993, whilst in Hollywood, a limo driver accused Tupac of using drugs whilst in his vehicle, and he found himself under arrest following a physical altercation between the pair. Charges against him, however, were subsequently dropped. He was arrested yet again just a month later on a charge that would on this occasion escort him to prison. Whilst attending a concert in Michigan, Tupac attacked a fellow rapper with a baseball bat his violent conduct landing him behind bars for 10 days. Despite his seemingly endless brushes with the law, Tupac was not yet ready to relinquish the aggressive lifestyle he had adopted, and rather than spending the time inside to cool off, he was back in jail before the end of the year. 
At Halloween, he was arrested on suspicion of an alleged shooting of two off-duty Atlanta police officers, whom Tupac insisted were subjecting a black motorist to unnecessary harassment. The incident was never fully investigated and once again no charges were brought. In November of the same year, though, he became reacquainted with a jail cell following the accusation by a female fan that he sexually abused her following an evening with friends in a New York nightclub. Tupac vehemently denied the charges but was expected to spend time inside under intense legal scrutiny whilst the crime was investigated. During this time, several West Coast rappers, including Warren G, Coolio and Ice-T, showed their support for Tupac by filming the video for Temptations, a single from Tupac's next album. Such support from his musical comrades was well received at a somewhat difficult time for Shakur. Although films and felonies have been laying big claims on Tupac's life and career, there would always be time for music. In the midst of the seemingly endless controversy, he was able to record and release his second album. It was relieving to find Tupac's name linked with business rather than brawn once more, and Strictly For My Niggers was unleashed upon the world on the 1st of February 1993. A much more fragmented recording than his debut, the album, however, fathered a slew of successful singles, including Papa's Song and I Get Around. Other notable tracks include Keep Your Head Up and Something to Die For. The former, a song about the strength of women who are exposed to the unwelcome attentions of disrespectful men, was ironic considering the circumstances in which the record was released. Irony, though, did not hinder the song's rise into the US Billboard Top 10. The latter track can be considered prescient, being, as it is, a warning shot from his mother about finding something worth dying for in the absence of something worth living for. His controversial lifestyle had done little to affect his appeal at the record counter, as the album, like its predecessor, sold comfortably, appealing to new and established fans alike, and ultimately achieving platinum status. The record's success would also win him the respect of the mainstream music industry, and he was nominated in the American Music Awards for Best New Rap Artist of 1993. By the end of the year, despite the success in the charts and at the box office, he was still awaiting trial for the alleged sexual offences. The year had been one of mixed fortunes for Tupac, and 1993 would no doubt be best forgotten in the Shakur household. He surely could not expect 1994 to be any worse, could he?